Mike Pagelli here. Thanks for tuning into this lesson. I will be talking about the Beatles recording of Help that they did in April of 1965. Now that year the Beatles had a new movie coming out and it was going to be called Eight Arms to Hold You, which is something Ringo came up with. So when John and Paul got together to try to write the title song, they ended up writing Eight Days a Week. But by April 11th of 65, the movie title for the new film was finalized and it was going to be called Help. So John and Paul get together in Kenwood and they write the title song. Now John had a song called Keep Your Hands Off My Babe and basically they reworked that one and turned it into Help. They knew it was going to be a hit record so they knew it had to be great. Um, but it was during John's what he referred to as his Fat Elvis period where he was very depressed. So uh, you know the lyrics depict that feeling. They're in the studio on April 13th, uh, 7 p.m. EMI Studio 2 and they do nine takes of the rhythm track and uh, take nine is the keeper. They had uh, bass and drums on track one, uh, John Lennon playing his famous 12 string and George playing electric on uh, track two and they got the rhythm track down in nine takes. Um, John did his lead vocal and Paul and George did the background vocals on uh, channel three and on track four John doubled his uh, lead vocal plus Ringo was doing uh, tambourine. Now they needed more tracks because uh, uh, George was having a hard time doing that descending part. So this is the first time they actually bounced from one four track machine to another. So they took the, uh, the instruments and they put it on track one and two of a new four track machine. They put all the vocals that were on track three and four on track three of the new machine and it opened up track four for George to do that descending line. Um, they say it was mixed on April 18th, but there are many different mixes and, and there's a lot of difference between the mono and the stereo mixes. Uh, you could hear some splicing of different rhythm track takes. There's also a uh, tambourine missing on, on some of the parts um, of the stereo mix. There's different lyrics on various mixes. And Paul and George are definitely more out of tune uh, on the stereo mix. But luckily the guitar parts stay the same, so I'll be able to, uh, to teach that properly. They also did a different mono mix on May 24th at CTS Studios uh, because the Beatles completely resang their part. Uh, and John changed a word or two and the tambourine, I believe, was, re was uh, moved, removed. So the, the mono mix of the, of the movie is different from the stereo mix, which is different from the mono mix. And there's a lot of different mixes. Uh, the album version that Capitol released uh, uh, has a 15 second kind of really corny James Bond intro that Ken Thorne uh, came up with. And a lot of radio stations were, were playing that 15 seconds before they played the song Help, thinking that that was what the Beatles intended, but it was not. Fun facts to know and tell, on uh, January 5th of, of uh, 66, the Beatles recorded an entirely new version to match the uh, poorly played version they did at, at, at Shea Stadium for the film that got released called The Beatles at Shea Stadium. Uh, John always thought the recording was way too fast. He, he thought the real feeling of the song was lost because they were trying to make a hit record. But he also said that he thought it was one of the best songs they ever wrote. They played it a lot live uh, during their uh, the latter half of 1965. They played it on the Sullivan Show on September 12th, and they played it on the American tour, and they also played it on live on their last uh, British tour. Uh, it was released on July 19th. So I think that's the backstory. Let's get started. <laughs> John Lennon is playing his 12-string Framus Hootenanny on Help. This is a Framus Model 76B, quality instrument made in Bavaria. If you can get your hands on one, second mortgage your home and go for it. <laughs> so you'll need these chords to play the song. You need a B minor. You'll need a G. You'll need an E. An E7. You need an A. You'll need an A sus2. You'll need a couple variations of C sharp minor. One like this, and one where you let the uh, fit, uh, first string ring out. You'll need a F sharp minor. Uh, first position D chord. You need a G like this. You're also going to need an A up here. 
And at the very end, you're gonna need a, a bar G like this. So I believe those are all the chords. Now the rhythm is deceptively simple. Uh, because of the percussion, you know, Ringo's hi-hat and the tambourine on the chorus, it, it appears that John is just strumming, 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 but he has parts set up for each, each little different section. So on the intro, he basically plays uh, two quarter notes and four eighth notes on each measure. So it's a B minor and it goes like this. I'll play it very slow. The beginning, the intro would go. Now before he gets to the G, he lifts up and you hear an open. You hear the open first, second, and third string before he gets to the G, then. Then on the E7, he plays uh, again, two quarter notes and four eighth notes. But this measure, it's two quarter notes, two eighth notes, and a quarter note. To the A. And then on the A, he taps on two and four in order to uh, set something up so George can overdub, uh, feel the correct rhythm to overdub that descending part. So in time, where's Ringo? Hi, Ringo. There's Ringo. Got this back in the 70s. Still works. Amazing. In time, let me play it for you. It would sound like this. Right? I'm gonna do that a little slower for you too, so you can so you can see how how involved that is. It's not straight strumming. And and John, remember, used kind of an oval pick, so I'm using the round part of of a of a normal you know Fender style medium. To get it, but if I were to do it slow, so you can really hear how intricate this uh, the beginning is, is like this. And then the song begins. Now, when he when on the on the uh, on first verse, he plays between A and A sus2, and he plays it like this. I'll do it slow. It's like... And then on the C sharp minor, he's letting... He's not, he's not uh, putting his first finger down on this G sharp. He's letting two E's ring out. The E on the fifth fret of the second string and the open E string of first. So it's like... And to the F sharp minor, the same kind of a figure. A little different here. To a D, G, open strings, A. So slowly, that first verse is like this. When you hear it in time, it just flies by and you, you might not notice all that different rhythmic interplay. Help me, Ringo. So in time. <laughs> right? So he had, he had parts worked out. Um, second verse, I'll just do the second verse slow. It's close to the first one, but there's a few variances. And it goes like this, second verse is. Charts and tabs at MikePacelli.com where I wrote out all, uh, every single measure uh, of what he played on every verse if you want to get it absolutely perfect. But you can see that it's just not just straight strumming. There's a lot of different syncopation and he, he definitely had parts worked out. Now, especially like on the chorus. On the first chorus, um, for the first four measures, he plays a quarter note and a six eighth notes on, on every bit of the first four measures, which are B minor. So slowly, the chorus is like, Then he, he switches up on the G. 
He purposely plays two quarter notes and four eighth notes for the first three measures, changes it on the fourth measure. So the, the, uh, the G part of the chorus is Similar on the E of the chorus, but he, he plays an E7 on beats four and of the first three measures. So he plays. And then just straight E's on the last measure. And he taps. So let me play a chorus here uh, at a slow tempo so you can get a feel of the whole chorus first chorus actually would be like this Finishes off with. Again, in tempo, Ringo. It just sounds, you, you might miss some of it if you just listen to it like this. Uh, mm. So as you can see, great, great rhythm playing, and just, you know, uh, that's why George barely plays anything on, the, on when they're doing the rhythm track, because John's part is so strong. Now the breakdown, I should talk about the breakdown, where is that? It would be on page three of my chart. He plays a little differently. Again, if you listen to, you know, the various rhythm in the background, you might be confused and think it's just straight strumming, but it is not straight strumming on the breakdown. Here's what he plays. He goes to a... a, a you know, second position A chord or bar chord, half of it, and plays this. I'll do it very slow for the breakdown. He plays this. Of importance is the way he picks up his first finger on the A chord to let the first string ring out. And he does something similar on the uh, C sharp minor. Right? So again, if, if you don't notice it, it just sounds like straight strumming, but in time, I'll show you what I mean. If you're playing in time, breakdown. So many parts. Again, charts and tabs at MikeBicelli.com if you want to get everyone perfectly. And the only difference is at the very ending, after the last, uh, the, after the last tap, you know, <clears throat> on the F sharp minor, he goes. I'm sorry. Plays that G before the A to A. So, if, like from the E. Proof positive that John Lennon was an amazing rhythm guitar player.
George Harrison is playing his 1963 Gretsch Tennessean on help. No doubt plugged straight into a Vox AC30. Um, this is a Gretsch Country Classic and I'm plugged into a 1965 Vox uh, Berkeley Super Reverb. One of the prototype versions they made uh, as a tube amp uh, ended up being solid state amp uh, for mass production, but boy, I love that amp. Okay, so he's once again the epitome of taste. Um, John Lennon's rhythm is so predominant that George knows you know, he just, he just needs to add and he needs to kind of stay out of the way. So during the intro, he plays these sweet little uh, intervals. Uh, George plays this. Over the B minor, he plays. Moving into the G. Moving into the E. And that's all he plays on intro. So in time, it's like this. It's like one, two, three, four. out. Now he doesn't play anything on the verse. He stays out of the verse and uh, he, he, he adds to the chorus by just playing on beats two and four and some low cool inversions of the chords. Um, he basically just plays on the sixth, fifth, and the uh, fourth string for the entire uh, chorus. So his B minor is voiced like this. And then kind of a power G and a power E. Again, just on the sixth, fifth, and fourth string, and he plays on beat um, two and four. So in time, it sounds like this. Here's the chorus. One, two, three, four. Just enough to add and let John's rhythm drive it. You know, George was just such an intelligent player. Now on the breakdown, uh, he, he strums through some, some chord voicing. So at first he plays an A like this. And then he plays a C sharp minor just on the middle strings. He plays a three note F sharp minor. A three note D four note inside G to an inside A. Second time he plays a five string A to a five string C sharp minor. A five string F sharp minor. A beetle D to that G to that A just adding enough, uh, you know, to what John was doing. And in time, here's the breakdown. One, two, three, four. Just absolutely perfect, you know, and it's such a simple part, but it adds so much to the breakdown. Then back to the chorus, he plays the same thing, and, and the only thing that changes at, at the very end, he plays where they play F sharp minor to A. So um, I'll just play the chorus out. He plays this F sharp minor again, and then just a, a, a root and fifth for his last A. So from the last chorus out, George's part would be like this. One, two, three, four. Once again, George Harrison being the epitome of good taste. George Harrison used his Tennessean to do the overdubs in help. I'm uh, using my country classic, but now I'm plugged into a 1964 Vox AC30, and I'm using a universal audio aux uh, to simulate a larger room 
to try to get the uh, wood floor sound that was e at EMI back then. All right, so on the intro, George simply plays some single notes. He starts on the uh, on on second measure and he plays. So all that is is a B to an A to a G, uh, a G, F sharp to E. So. And then he plays this descending line. Now you may wonder, where does a young guitar player come up with something so unique? Well, you know, George was influenced by folks like Chuck Berry and uh, a lot of kind of, you know, blues players who would play a standard turnaround. Like if you're in the key of uh, A and you're the end of a, of a verse coming from E to D, like... A standard turnaround would be... Right? So that's basically going from G to E on the D string. And from E to C sharp on the B string. Put it together. Well, George kept the G to E on the D string. But he took that E to C sharp and he made it an octave lower. So in essence, he has... But he let some strings ring out. He let the G string ring out, which is the seventh of an A chord, and he let the B string ring out, which is the ninth of an A chord. So you have... Just absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Now, there's a little confusion on it because if you watch some of the live recordings, sometimes George plays that line differently. Uh, he, he has played it like this. So that's the E to C sharp, but with a B, G, B. On the, another live version, he also just plays the E to C sharp and lets the D string, the G string, and the B string around. He goes. But on the 45 mono version, which is what I consider the correct version, and it's also the only versions that the Beatles ever uh, thought were, were the correct versions, he most certainly plays. Right, and so uh, he plays that in the intro, and then he plays it during the choruses too, when they go, help me if you can. Right, he plays. Mm, two. Just an absolutely brilliant part that George Harrison came up with. Uh, and the only difference is, uh, I think, the very last time he plays that descending line, and then he goes to a, a, a root fifth of F sharp minor to an A, very ending a hard A. So the very last time, uh, you know. Just, uh, I can't stress it enough, I, I find that to be absolutely brilliant for a, a young guitar player in his 20s. Well, I put it all together in a sound alike so you can see how all the parts fit together, so let's have a look at that.
I certainly hope you enjoyed that, and I always suggest you learn all the parts, play along with my sound alike, and you'll get it just like the Beatles. If you'd like to drop me a line, you can do so at MikePacelli.com. That's where the chart and tabs are for all my video lessons. And if you would be so kind, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. So have fun playing this great iconic song, and until next time, I'm Mike Pacelli. Thanks for hanging out with me.